Hi, everyone. Welcome to this very special United Nations Association of the USA Town Hall exploring the US return to UNESCO. We are so excited that you are here and we'll get started in just one minute. Uh, we're just waiting for all of our attendees. Fantastic. My name is Farah Salim Ak and I am the Senior Director of Programs and Policies here at UNA USA and I am delighted to be serving as the moderator for tonight's program. I am even more delighted to say that because of the efforts of thousands of UNA USA supporters combined with hundreds of US legislators, policymakers, and advocates within our larger UN community, as of today, Audrey Azoulay, who is the Director General of UNESCO, has indicated that the United States has officially rejoined UNESCO. Do we know how to time our town halls or what? Of course, there is still some work to do to ensure the completion of this process, which we will dig into this evening. But first, let's provide a bit of historical foundation uh, for tonight. This latest round of the US reentry to UNESCO was not the first time the two parted ways. In 1984, under President Reagan, the US withdrew from UNESCO and did not rejoin UNESCO until 20 years later under President George W. Bush. The US remained a member state of UNESCO until things became, let's say, complicated in 2011 following the withdrawal of US funding to UNESCO as a consequence of UNESCO's admission of Palestine. Then in 2017, in more recent history, the Trump administration filed its notice to withdraw from UNESCO, but it wouldn't be until 2019 until the US had officially exited. Now fast forward even more to 2023, and as I'm sure you've noticed, within just the past two months, much has happened between the US and UNESCO. First, a letter was sent from the US government to UNESCO leaders signaling an interest in rejoining. And then just recently on June 30th, UNESCO held an extraordinary session at which time the member states, a whopping majority, voted to approve the US proposal in order to start the process to rejoin UNESCO. So that brings us to tonight, where we have an absolutely unique opportunity to not only open this vault to understand the very complex history between the US and UNESCO, but hopefully to also be inspired to take action in support of a stronger partnership and to ensure that the US finalizes the process to rejoin UNESCO. I am joined by experts who have each been involved in some aspect of the US and UNESCO relationship. I am so honored and pleased that Ambassador David Killian, Melinda Kimball, and Jordi Hannum will share their various perspectives on the US and UNESCO, whom I will briefly introduce, but you can find their full bios, which will be linked in the chat. So it is my pleasure now to introduce Ambassador David Killian, who was appointed by President Obama as US Permanent Representative to UNESCO in 2009 and served in that position until 2013. And just prior to that, Mr. Killian was Senior Professional Staff Member for the US House Committee on Foreign Affairs. So it's safe to say he's been on all sides or both sides of the US-UN relationship. Welcome Ambassador Killian. I'd also like to introduce Melinda Kimball, who serves as a senior fellow here at the UN Foundation and who has previously worked in the US Department of State's Bureau of International Organizations on the UNESCO portfolio and who coordinates the Americans for UNESCO initiative. We also welcome you, Melinda. Thanks. Hello. And I'd also like to introduce my colleague, some of you, a lot of you know Jordi Hannum, who is the executive director at the Better World Campaign here with the UN Foundation. In his role, Jordi interfaces with the congressional offices and grass tops efforts that connect members of Congress with the UN. Jordi, as always, welcome. Hello, everyone. 
So uh, again, we're so appreciative to bring you these amazing speakers who will help our members and other Americans who have joined us tonight, who are interested in the UN to gain insight on what's happening in the news and out there in Washington, DC and beyond. Uh, in true town hall fashion, I will say, I'm going to moderate a, a few questions to each of the speakers to provide a little bit of a foundation to get us started. But then we definitely want to open it up to you, the audience, for a good portion of the session. So please have your questions ready, pop them in the chat, or be ready and poised uh, to use your raise hand function when it's time. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, Ambassador Killian, let's get started with you because you have personally been involved in so many capacities with UNESCO on behalf of the United States. And first of all, may I say congratulations, your efforts are 100% paying off. Um, but in, in your past, during your time as ambassador to UNESCO, you've been quoted as saying the following, there are critical American interests at stake at UNESCO moral, cultural, national security, even economic interests. We think this is a strategic piece of real estate in the international system. It can get us to places we couldn't get to otherwise. Can you please expand on this quote, which is it's a terrific quote, and, and what you meant by that place that the US couldn't get to otherwise? Thanks, yeah. Um, I think it's appropriate that we're having a town hall tonight to discuss this, to discuss what our equities are in this UN agency, because the United States invented UNESCO, the United States and the UK after World War II, and we designed it to spread our values and to um, spread our model of participatory democracy. And the UN is the only international organization that exists in the, in the entire system that's literally designed to be penetrated by civil society. And the United States has the most vibrant civil society in the entire world. And so we are so well equipped to advance our interests in education, science, and culture at UNESCO. And the equities, people wouldn't believe the equities that exist in UNESCO. For example, if there's gonna be a global regime on artificial intelligence, it'll have to be negotiated at UNESCO. Wouldn't you want the United States to have a seat, not only to have a seat at the table, but to be a driving force when that takes place. Thank you, Ambassador Killian. I like that. That was that was very punchy. I like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, thanks, and we'll we'll come back to you for a little bit more context from your time as uh, ambassador. And Jordi, we've uh, heard from Ambassador Killian about some of the more institutional history um, between the US and UNESCO. But I, I know for a fact that both BWC and UNA USA have also been uh, a significant part of the, this relationship in the past. So can you share a little bit more for our audience about the grass tops and the grassroots efforts that have been done to support the US and UNESCO partnership? I sure, I sure can, and I just I want to begin with a, to, a thank you to to David, to Melinda, to all of you. If you'd asked me eight years ago or four years ago, I would have said privately that it was going to be very difficult uh, to to get the U.S. back in in UNESCO. Uh, but through our combined efforts, we we kept the torch burning, and and it made a huge difference. So, as a brief recap, I just want to give a, a few highlights of a few of the the BWC, UNA, UNESCO events. So we did an event on the Hill with the Washington Post senior op-ed columnist, Eugene Robinson, and a UNESCO representative, highlighting the agency's invaluable work around freedom of speech and protecting journalists. Uh, we did an event with the National Park Service in which they discussed the huge economic impacts that come from UNESCO World Heritage Sites. So I saw a few folks from, from San Antonio here on the call, but at the Alamo in San Antonio, the designation of World Heritage Site alone resulted in an overall economic impact of $100 million with a thousand new jobs and bringing an additional two million in hotel tax revenue. So we highlighted these uh, stories, and most notably, Peter uh, will remember that um, we wheeled a white, sparkling white grand piano into the Rayburn House office building, <laughs> which is not easy to do, uh, so that Herbie Hancock could play for members of Congress and tout the benefits uh, of UNESCO. 
Uh, but these events would have gone for naught if it weren't all for you regularly reminding members that you wanted the U.S. to rejoin, if David wasn't working behind the scenes, if Melinda wasn't quarterbacking Americans for UNESCO. So thank you. Uh, just uh, this is really a special day, literally the day. Uh, and so uh, I can't uh, say how much we appreciate it. But there's a there's a big but here. It's important to remember that as special as this day is, we have some uh, major obstacles ahead. And we'll talk about that a little more. Thanks. Thanks, Jordy. And I, I think that's good to uh, to couch uh, some of our celebration with some of the steps that we need to take, which we'll dig into in a little bit. But um, Jordy, you had mentioned that Melinda quarterbacks Americans for UNESCO. So Melinda, let's turn to you. But a little bit before, um, in 1991, when you were at the State Department's Bureau of International Organizations, that's where you worked on the UNESCO portfolio um, and where you actually collaborated with the UN Foundation to help support the US reentry to UNESCO, I believe during the Bush administration. Uh, can you please tell us a bit more about what was what was the general American sentiment like about UNESCO at the time? And then how did this factor into your work and, and then also the larger government approach to rejoining UNESCO? I I think it's critically important to understand that in the 1980s, the Heritage Foundation, I don't know if I should mention them on this webinar, identified the UN agencies that were worth something and the ones that weren't. And they particularly targeted UNESCO. Because at that time, the director general and Bao had started to talk about a world information order that would exclude bad information or true information about developing countries because he believed that the developed world was shaping the attitudes of the public in democracies against developing countries. And of course, the United States had a big reaction. This was gonna block free speech. It was going to block unbiased journalism and we really began to have a collision course with UNESCO. By the time I came into international organizations, we've been out of UNESCO since 1984. But the first thing one of our staff people said to me, you know, UNESCO is a lot more than free speech, journalism, et cetera. It's also science, education, international oceans policy, standard setting on degree acceptance, hundreds of things going on in UNESCO very few Americans knew about. And I believe UNESCO being based in Paris meant people were very unfamiliar with it. The other dilemma I found is, and I was responsible for all the UN agencies, is UNESCO didn't have a cabinet supporter. Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome had USDA. WHO had HHS. ILO had Department of Labor. That meant they had domestic constituencies concerned with the agency. People really didn't know UNESCO. When you walk into UNESCO meeting, it's the Minister of Culture of many countries in charge, or the Minister of Education, not very strong 
or existing cabinet agencies in the United States. So I became, I came quickly to realize we didn't understand our equities in UNESCO and we had no central government base to support them. Thanks, Melinda. That's really fascinating. Thank you so much for giving us some insight, peeling back some of the layers, if you will, uh, at the time. And now uh, turning back to Ambassador Killian, we've talked some of the you know, historical context of the US and UNESCO relationship, but now, and, and Jordi is tempering our celebration uh, for today, uh, but can you expand upon some of the challenges you faced it, as you as you personally and with other colleagues pursued the reinstatement of the U.S. as part of UNESCO? And, and what can we expect as far as challenges in your opinion? Yeah, well, um, there are incredible challenges for whoever is going to be the next ambassador to UNESCO. It, it's not like any other job in the international organizational system, and it's very like any other diplomatic jobs. The, the equities are vast. Um, you're only as good as, as how many different um, Americans you involve in UNESCO's work and in, in UNESCO's meetings and its outcomes. You're only as good as the advice you take from great American experts in education, science, and culture. And that's not how our State Department normally works. You know, the State Department's not set up very well to deal with something like UNESCO. And, and, you know, at the time that we had Melinda Kimball, we were very lucky. But in <laughs> most cases, the I.O. Bureau is very wary of UNESCO. It's, it's too messy. It's not something they want to deal with. They don't want to have to put together a national commission of over 100 experts in education, science, culture, architecture, on and on and on and on. And they don't want to engage those people once they have them. So the uh, ambassador has an incredible challenge to, you know, be like, more like a member of Congress and to engage all aspects of American civil society in, in his or her work and, in, in, and to define U.S. equities. I think the State Department sometimes has a hard time defining what U.S. equities are at UNESCO. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's it if you have a follow-up. Yeah, I think um, we'll we'll come back. I think Jordi will will complement uh, what you're saying, maybe by talking about what's literally today, what's happening, um, as far as the next steps that uh, we can take. Uh, I'm teasing you, Jordi, when I say that you're you're kind of tempering our celebration. Um, but tell us more, and then we'll circle back with Ambassador before, Killian about some before additional. Jordy does, before Jordi does, if you just say that you know everyone's touched on this, but one of the reasons why it's so difficult to have sustained U.S. engagement in UNESCO, sustained political support for the United States engagement in UNESCO, is because the interests, there are vast inter American interests in UNESCO, from business, from science, from, from education sector of our society, of our economy. Um, it's such a disparate group of interests. And to, to, to bring those groups together, to have a political impact, is an incredibly difficult task. And I I think in terms of a very large organization that has the capacity to do that, the UN Foundation, the UN Association, probably <laughs> about it. So your role is absolutely critical. That's a terrific segue, Ambassador Killian. Jordi, what, what, what should we anticipate? What can we do? <laughs> Yeah, well, I we can we can do a lot. We we can do a lot. We've we've done a lot, but uh, we're we're not quite um, <clears throat> over over the mountain yet. So I think it's just important. Again, today is is a really um, a special day, uh, but um, you know there there is a big caveat, and that is as a condition of readmission, uh, the U.S. will need to repay its arrears and meet 22% of the, of the UNESCO's annual budget, so our, our annual dues. And there's been a, a little confusion on this, and we've gotten questions on this because the, you know, the wording in the press announcement says we're in, and, and so you could think, great, you know, super, let's um, kind of let's get started. But if, if I could make an analogy here, so if we think of UNESCO as a giant you know, boarding house, a gorgeous Frank Lloyd Wright house with falling <laughs> water between the floors and Picasso's on the wall, um, you know, until this year, the house was locked to the United States. But in December of, of last year, we had a key made and on a June 8th, we knocked on the door and on June 30th, UNESCO opened the door and today 
they welcomed us in the house. But we cannot stay there. We cannot decide what hangs on the walls, what plays on the radio, whether it's Herbie Hancock, you know, unless we meet our annual contributions and pay back our arrears. And so the clock in the house is, is ticking. And specifically, as a condition of readmission, we must be a member in good standing. So as a reminder, we are 619 million in arrears uh, to the agency. That's what accrued over uh, from 2011 to 2017 uh, from not kind of paying our uh, our annual uh, dues. So to that end, the Biden administration earmarked 150 million uh, for the organization for this year and has agreed to make payments towards the rest of the debt it accrued uh, from 2011 to 2017. It also said the U.S. will pay its its 75 million in annual dues, which is is equivalent to 22 percent of of the budget. But Congress needs to appropriate the funds, and it's unclear if they will. So last year, when Congress passed the bill, it authorized payment. It, it allowed a waiver for us to do it, but it did not appropriate any money. Just two weeks ago, when the House State Foreign Operations uh, Subcommittee put forward its bill, uh, which kind of makes recommendations for the international affairs budget, for the State Department, for the UN, uh, the bill intentionally provided no funds for UNESCO. Select Republicans made that clear. Now, importantly, the bill does not repeal language from, from last year, uh, which allows the U.S. to resume financial contributions. So there's an opening, but we have our work to do. We have to make the case uh, for funding. And, and the arguments have, have never been stronger. Uh, David made the point on um, artificial intelligence. In fact, when Secretary of State Blinken uh, testified in front of the Senate committee, he said, we're not uh, rejoining as a gift to UNESCO, but because there are things happening that actually matter. For example, the organization is, quote, working on the rules, norms, and standards for artificial intelligence. We want to be there. And in November, UNESCO adopted the first global standard on the ethics of AI. When we get to the Q&A uh, Q session, I can uh, bring up a, a very interesting uh, example of, of AI and, and uh, driving that, that impacts us all. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just an example of just all the ways this technology can be used mm -hmm. and misused. But when you look at what UNESCO was doing around education, and particularly if you think of COVID-19 disruptions, UNESCO is, is highlighting what schools, particularly in remote areas without a lot of resources, Forces can do to get to get kids back up. When you talk about countering China, well, when the U.S. left, China became the largest contributor. Um, you know, the U.S. needs to be there, uh, and and part of that is uh, is is paying up. So if we want to stay inside the house, we want to be at the table, then we have to to pay our dues, and we're going to need your help. And we're going to be reaching out to you over the coming weeks and months to tell your members. It's 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 really a matter of reaching out to your members of Congress and telling them tomorrow. The House Appropriations Committee is meeting. They're going to be discussing UNESCO. There are going to be members saying, you know, we shouldn't pay them. We shouldn't get back in. We need to be telling them, please do. We need to be telling the members who are champions uh, of UNESCO, of which there uh, are a number, Senator Coons, uh, a, a host of others who have really been pushing this. And we need to tell them how important it is, uh, but we've got to, we've actually got to pay our dues. Thanks. Can I say something about this, Farah? I think- Of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think what Jordy's saying is very important. I think it's very important for um, UNA members uh, to be very strategic of, about the approach. This is not an easy political uh, task that we all have. And it's very important to be smart with our arguments. Early on, in the early days of the Biden administration, Milan Verveer asked me to write a memo for Jake Sullivan on you know, what the approach on UNESCO funding and UNESCO reentry should be. And that, in that memo, I wrote that it should all, all be about competition with China and AI. Make arguments that make life difficult for the opponents. Don't make arguments that don't make life difficult for the opponents. I, I'd like to interject. I think it's important to understand how China has taken on the whole UN system, including UNESCO and try to position itself so it influences the policy within agencies. And while China may head FAO, we have a huge U.S. constituency for agriculture, ag trade, to kind of offset the influence of China. 
in FAO. As David said, in UNESCO, our kind of constituency is dispersed. It's important to understand when we left UNESCO in 1984, every US university, state university, small college was actively engaged through our national commission. Americans for UNESCO, which is a network of people working on that through various broader interests in UNESCO has tried to keep this alive, but there's much less interest among our academic sector in UNESCO today as we saw in 1980s. And we don't have universal consensus on how to approach education at many levels because education is so much a local operation or a state operation in the US. And whether we like it or not, UNESCO's first mission is education. Its second mission is science. The Board of International Science Organizations, though, at the National Academy, when I joined that board, they never discussed UNESCO, even though UNESCO's science budget was 10 times that of the scientific unit. So we tried to rectify that. And when we re-entered in the Bush administration, we had a great network. But as we stopped paying dues, we stopped supporting activities, a lot of that evaporated very quickly. Thanks, Melinda, for layering in, because I, I did actually want you to, to expound upon Americans for UNESCO, especially as we look to uh, see individual ways that we can contribute. And I do want to mention that uh, my colleague Maria Amala will be um, coming on towards the end to give even more explicit directions on how we can take action. So um, we'll, we will definitely circle back to that. Uh, I did want to ask one additional question, Ambassador Killian, before we open it up to Q&A from the audience. Um, you, you started to touch on this, but I'm hoping that you can dig just a bit further. Uh, I have been reading, you know, that the, the two main reasons, and, and I, I guess that came from your memo um, specifically, is, is AI and uh, China. Can you, for our members, again, we are we are Americans, a part of a grassroots movement who care about the UN, so we may not know um, some of the nitty gritty. If you could just kind of share um, some tidbits that will help us in our in our advocacy asks. Yeah, well, the reason the reason things went a little bit better this time than they did in the Obama administration. Remember, the Obama administration was completely unsuccessful at getting an authorization for the U.S. to reach UNESCO, and the Biden administration here has had this success that the Obama administration could not pull off. One of the things that helped them is that uh, there are no, you know, died in the wool opponents like there were during, we had, we had faced this force called Ileana ross Leighton, who was a disciple of John Bolton and was a, a very, very passionately fighting to prevent anything from happening on UNESCO. And she had the right place in the Congress to do that. Um, we have some important opponents like Michael McCall, who's the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee right now in, in the House. Um, but these arguments are persuasive, the, even to people like McCall. The China argument in particular has resonated with him. It has been very persuasive with Lindsey Graham. And UNESCO deserves a tremendous amount of the cre credit for the success that, we, that we've had with Lindsey Graham. They have been so innovative and creative in dealing with him. It's incredible. And I go back to the universities because Melinda talked about how important the connections between universities 
and UNESCO are. And if you've ever worked in a congressman's personal office, you know how important universities in his district are to a congressman or a senator. And um, Lindsey Graham had a, a constituent. He had a, a, a professor at the University of South Carolina who desperately wanted to be a UNESCO professor. You can become a UNESCO professor. Yeah. And Graham was getting, he was getting um, lobbied by the, by the powerful board of the University of, of South Carolina on this. And meanwhile, you know, UNESCO also came in. Audrey Azoulay, she's like the Nancy Pelosi of the UN world. She's incredible. She came in and she, um, she, she uh, gave the university, the guy, the, the chair, but she, you know, she went further than that. She, she went to South Carolina and gave him the university's chair. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and they've worked really they've hard to build relations with his staff and they have pushed this China angle and, he's, and he has a, adopted it. He's not, he's not a proponent, but he's, uh, I would say he's a quiet supporter now, which is incredible. So that's the, that can be done with creativity, with realizing who the, the, the right people are to lobby, the right people, the people that you might not even think that you could seduce, but you know maybe somehow you could and come up with a plan and, and it's amazing what can happen. We still have to worry. We still have to worry about the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, McCall, though. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you for those anecdotes, Ambassador Killian. I hope you will queue up a few more to, to sprinkle in along the way. But um, I do want to open it up to you, to our attendees. We have over 150 attendees. So um, I did see a few in the chat. But first, if you would like to verbally ask your question, um, I'm happy to take any raised hands. Uh, and if you do want to verbally ask your question, my request is that your question is brief to the point and ends in a question mark. <laughs> um, so as people are queuing up to raise their hands, I did see one from the chat that I'll just um, pull out. Um, I think we, um, what became of the US, Jeffrey Laurenti, what became of the US National Commission for UNESCO during the period of American arrears? Melinda, this might be for you, uh, from 2011 to 2019. And then after the Trump withdrawal took effect, will a new one be uh, have to be reconstituted or did the commission never pass out of existence? No, the commission actually was dissolved in part because the commission didn't understand how it could function without payments and voluntary support for UNESCO activities. The commission was pretty active during Louise Oliver's time and David Killian's time, and we tried very much to support Crystal Nix Hines with Herbie Hancock and other ambassadors, but it's very hard to do so if you're not actively funding key UNESCO programs or initiatives. We were able to keep World Heritage going in part because World Heritage can be a revenue maker for people who become involved in World Heritage sites. But that's only a tiny bit of what UNESCO does. And I think it's incredibly important to take this waiver authority and start refunding activities that UNESCO and how we do that. I appreciate Jordy's tutorial because many years ago, Peter Yo and I worked on UN arrears as a huge problem. And it's not easy to get bipartisan consensus on funding multilateral activities. So, there's huge problems ahead. And to keep us engaged in UNESCO, we need money. Thanks, Melinda. Well said. Um, I'm going to scroll down. I don't see any raised hands, 
please, I did not mean to scare anyone away by saying, please have a question mark at the end of your question. Um, so feel free to raise your hand and uh, I will go down to, uh, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, Kathia Flemons um, and uh, Ambassador Killian, um, maybe best for you. How many UNESCO chairs are there in the USA? And how does an organization or institute of higher education become or qualify to become a UNESCO chair? I, I think there are about 30. And I'm, I think there's an application process. But, um, additionally, everything at UNESCO is political. And it's very difficult for the impossible. United States to advocate for American university, UNESCO university chairs um, but without uh, paying our dues and without having a, without having an ambassador there. So um, Audrey Azoulay was smart enough to, to bring the, the, the chair in from the University of South Carolina, but um, you, can't, you can't get all of these kind of equities delivered unless you're there. Right, we haven't several chairs, including Phyllis McGrath at Georgetown and Dan Wagner at Penn, who remained active and remain active with UNESCO. But it's important to be either chair of a department or have a research specialty that tracks with UNESCO. And that's why you see Dan Wagner, who's an expert in literacy, is frequently in Paris at the Executive Council and other meetings. Yeah, and Melinda, I think it's really important for us to thank Phyllis and Dan and Herbie Hancock and yeah. Forrest, Forrest Whitaker, who kept the United States alive at UNESCO for all of these years. I, I had the great privilege of getting the commissions for both Forrest Whitaker and Herbie Hancock and for launching Forrest uh, on his work with child soldiers and peace and reconciliation and Herbie Hancock and creating International Jazz Day. And while we were gone and not paying, both Herbie and Forrest created tens of millions of dollars. They, they, create, they built their own NGOs, the Herbie Hancock Institute of Jazz and the Whitaker Development Institute and Forrest is literally, he's been housed, his offices are inside. He's been doing great work all over Africa, all this time that we've been gone and he deserves a big thank you. So does Herbie. I, I, I just like to add the United States is such a force in scientific research and digital technology. And we haven't talked a lot about UNESCO's role in the World Information Summit. UNESCO is central to the cultural and social adaptation of digital, digital technology globally. And we need to be at the table. We cannot do this through the international Telecommunications Union alone. Agreed. Thank you both. Um, I'm actually going to uh, ask Nancy Martin, um, who's raised your hand, if you uh, wanted to direct your question to one of our guests. Um, maybe it's a Jordy question, but I don't really know. Um, I noticed when I was in Anchor Wat, um, Japan was working to restore some of the um, artifacts and buildings and it was a huge job. And people were climbing everywhere and walking around and there was no protection. And I wondered, will the United States um, work with other countries to protect places? Are we open to working together? Because it seemed like if countries worked together, they could accomplish a lot more and learn about each other. Now, uh, Jordy, do you want me to, oh, do you want to field it or? Yeah, I mean, I can say a couple things on, 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 on 
UNESCO is just vital work in, in cultural preservation. Um, and um, I mean, I mentioned the World Heritage Sites, and it's incredibly important because it's a real economic driver. And so certainly one argument, uh, again, that we've that we've used within the states. But I mean, I saw myself, I traveled uh, with the, the UN agency to, to Mosul, Iraq. Um, and this was shortly after, um, you know, the invasion um, by by ISIS, and then they destroyed this this um, famous famous mosque, um, and um, the Iraqis the support of the international community, um, you know, kicked ISIS out. And then one of the first UN agencies on the ground ground restoring this this mosque, which um, which again uh, was a major um, cultural importance to to Iraqis. Um, UNESCO was there and and rebuilding it kind of as as we spoke and you can imagine just how important that was to to Iraqis to feel like um, that you know these you know this major important part of their culture that had been literally destroyed was being restored and it was the UN uh, at the front of it and so there's just all sorts of examples of where the UN of where UNESCO is 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 working in really uh, important ways and again our contributions um, our contributions can play. Uh, can play a a, a key role, uh, a key role, a key role there. And I, I'm I'm happy to come back. I saw there was a couple of questions just about kind of what, kind of exactly what Congress had done, and and I I can happy to explain that. And uh, in terms of funding, and and um, and and give some other specific examples uh, as well in terms of the the day to day impact. But I'll I'll stop there in terms of just control. to briefly follow up on world heritage. It's important to understand from the beginning we have engaged the National Park Service, that Department of Interior, and even if they aren't necessarily providing money, they hold workshops. They inform people, they go out to sites and help UNESCO deliver approaches that can protect sites. I want to also say, of course, Japan has been a major voluntary funder of UNESCO, and they were a major supporter of our reentry in June. So Japan's a really important player. And we, to the extent we can cooperate across member states, our results will be better. Can I just say something too? Um, what Linda says is absolutely right. Uh, the US Park Service is one of the leading global experts on cultural preservation. And every time that I represented the United States at a World Heritage meeting, the National Park Service was right there, wherever we were, because the World Heritage meetings would move around the globe, telling me exactly what to do. And um, I was very appreciative of their expertise. But I'd also want to point out, I think the State Department has a, a program they, they have had for many, many years called the Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation. And, and the, those US ambassadors are able to, to do cultural preservation projects in their countries. And it's a great place. It's a great pro program for us to highlight when we're members of UNESCO. And, and I did that when I was ambassador. And also just a larger point here. So I made this point at the very outset. We invented UNESCO. All, all of this stuff is, is our US ideas. World Heritage is a US idea. It, it comes from our National Park Service. Cultural preservation largely is a US idea. And, um, you know, we, we invented this thing and it, it, it serves our equities enormously and then we lost the plot line more than once. America's best idea, Ken Burns, <laughs> our parks. Right here. There you go, I like that. I wanna turn now, um, Christina Martinez, I don't know if you'd like to verbally ask, uh, I see you have two related questions. Um, if not, I'm happy to relay them. Um, how does good. U.S. Oh, go ahead. Yes, good evening. I believe that Maria is going to also uh, respond to those or briefly address them. But it's basically how as community chapters, we can communicate or simplify the message of how these 
historic event translate to the daily life of the people. So it will be better for them to engage and understand and continue advocating with the with uh, with the Congress people or with any other steps that we should be leading or taking. Jordi, I'm going to first pop this over to you. And you're right, Christina Maria will be able to give you more specifics. But Jordi, more broadly, do you want to, to talk through some of this? Sure. Um, in terms of just outreach with uh, with members and and yeah. Um, so um, yeah, and 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 a couple of things just to because because I, um, I I saw one other question on 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 exactly kind of what did. Um, uh, the House do or, or not do, and and right, so they just put forward a bill. It's, it's very timely, uh, which again has kind of funding. And they, but what they did not do was specifically did not provide any kind of resources uh, for UNESCO. So it was a uh, it was a, a very clear uh, omission. The Im really important thing that we can do right now um, is certainly with members on the House Appropriations Committee. Um, who are, you know, will be meeting uh, tomorrow, but but really to talk with your members, your House members, your Senate members, and just talk about the importance of UNESCO. And it's a very clear message. We hope there will be, you know, funding for it. Again, last year, uh, there was language that allowed us to do it. And now it's, it's simply a matter of providing the dollars. And um, it's it's very important, as, as David knows all too well, for the past 10 years, there were the voices of those who were against it, of, of US um, joining were, were louder than those who were for it. And 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 now there's a moment, I think people understand when we left China, we said China was gonna step up and they did. And they're literally the largest contributor, just as we said, it happened. I think there's a real understanding now that that's not in our interest, we should, we should be there. And so there's a very clear argument you know, to make Republicans and Democrats, everybody's talking about countering China, confronting China, however you, you want to put it, it's in our interests uh, to be there. And so, um, but we have to pay our dues. It's, we can't, we can't just say we're there and not pay our dues. So it's, it's, it's a, it is, it is a, as straightforward an ask uh, as we can get in, in talking with your members for this August recess coming up through letters um, to tell them to to simply please support uh, funding um, for UNESCO um, and and there's a host of examples and we're going to be uh, to be uh, providing those uh, you know in the coming in the coming weeks and 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 we we have those we have those now but um, again we just um, need you to reach out to your members um, and ask you to support funding for UNESCO. Jordi, I think it, it would be useful for your members to to know. I mentioned earlier that there are different there are differences to the current situation in the Obama administration. Yeah. One is incredibly that there is no fierce entrenched opponent in a strategic position to block things like Ileana Ross Layton was in those days. But the other the other element that exists that didn't exist then is there are extremely effective champions for UNESCO today in the US Congress. The most important is Senator Chris Coons. Mm -hmm. He's a dogged supporter. UNESCO funding. He has incredible power in the Senate of persuasion and influence because he's he's literally seen as the Paul Laxalt of Joe Biden. He kind of represents Joe Biden in the Senate. And um, uh, largely because I think of Crystal uh, Nix Hines, he is completely committed to this. He does so much behind the scenes. He uh, puts so much pressure on his colleagues. And even, even a, across the way in the House, he engages in lobbying. Um, it's just incredible. And, and Gregory Meeks has, has really come up and, and become quite a champion as well. And, and those, are, those are critical elements to success in, a, in a, a campaign like that. And just to Christina, just to tell you, I've spent a lot of, I spent a lot of time in, on Capitol Hill working in personal members offices and, and in, of course on the Foreign Affairs Committee. You cannot imagine how impactful it is for a, a passionate constituent to come in and actually meet with their member of Congress and to passionately tell them that they care about UNESCO because they don't hear that. And so it's gonna have an impact if somebody actually, you know, takes the time to get a meeting with them. And I think meetings are much more impactful in the district. I think when you get to your congressman 
in, in the district. They're not as distracted. Um, they're, you know, feeling close to their constituency. And so that's a great place to do it. Thanks. Thanks, and Ambassador Killian. And, and that tees up uh, exactly Maria. some of Maria's asked. So uh, we're foreshadowing a bit here. Um, and I want to get to two questions. And Jeffrey, I see your hand up. I just wanted to get to someone else um, before we come back to you. Uh, Jax Harrison in the chat. Um, Jax, I don't know if you'd like to ask your question about uh, AI and uh, how the future is imperative. Would you like to ask that question? Hi. Sure. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Go ahead. Hi. What I was asking is, my name is Jack Harris, and I have a company called Innovation for Good and a foundation called Stop Child Traffic. So that's the viewpoint we come from. What I was asking is basically we've heard so much about the war on technology and AI and the how China is so much further ahead of us at the moment in many different ways with some of the technology, not all of it. But what can UNESCO do now? We've had a great start in November with the ethics, but what can we do now and what, what can we do um, in the future in a civil organizations to help support the efforts of putting America and the United Nations, UNESCO, at the front of being the influencer at the table, basically? Well, Who'd like to pop the, go ahead, Ambassador. Yeah, anyone. <laughs> yeah, one incredible asset that UNESCO has right now is a, a world class. Their director general, Audrey Azule, uh, is this incredible woman who was the minister of culture and has great political skills and is um, uh, very, um, very charismatic as well. And so um, if we encourage her to take the on, it'll be very helpful. But one thing that's always so important to remember is that UNESCO, it's a universal membership organization, but it's a membership organization. So that means that it's, it's, like a, it's like a political body. You know, it's made up of 195 countries and they all have a voice and they all have a vote. So in order for things to come out right, it's not self-regulating. The, the, leading, the leading power of the, in the international system, the United States has to, has to be there. It has to be working. It doesn't just have to be there. It has to have, have a talented ambassador who understands how to influence other other ambassadors and knows how to play the game both in Paris and capitals knows how to go to, to his fellow ambassador ambassadors in other capitals when he can get a vote changed and um, it's it's a political process and people miss that and it won't come out well if we don't play the political process in a smart and effective way with a talented diplomats. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just want to yeah, I just want to say one other one other thing on the on the AI uh, side of it, and and it it relates to a, a a question I saw earlier, just kind of on the day to day. You know, what what's uh, what would be the day to day impact of this and the importance of it? But I just put in the chat box a, an article that actually my colleague was uh, throw a flag, which is is really fascinating. Um, but it talks about so we talked about um, UNESCO's kind of convening, but at, in AI right now, so. I don't know uh, if, if anyone uh, will be driving to work tomorrow or driving anywhere, but uh, there's a, this fascinating example of there's this drowsiness technology. If any of you drive a car right now, I have it now. If you cross into a lane, it gives gives you an alert. Well, let's say it's 10 a.m. You're driving, you cross a lane because you move away from something. And then sadly, you, you happen to hit something. That technology can be used against you in, in, a, mm -hmm. in a court of law. And there's all sorts of ways, right? If you're driving on a country road, there isn't a middle lane. But that's just a perfect example that impacts all of us, right? UNESCO is the one holding forums right now, highlighting that this could be used you know, against you. So it's just a, a perfect example of, we have got to be you know, at, at the table. I mean, you think of all the ways that, that China um, is using it. Can you just imagine a certain what the US is not at the table for these types of discussions? Uh, it's, it's truly scary. And so UNESCO is a really important um, convener. Again, in November, they put forward the kind of the first standards around it. So we have we've really got to, got to be there. And so that's where our, our voices can be important. Again, we'll, we'll, 
provide examples. And and David mentioned some key members, but we're really well positioned. There's, you know, on, on the House side, Barbara Lee, we have a strong presence in, in California, and she is the key Democrat on, on the uh, House State Foreign Operations Committee. On the uh, Texas, strong presence in Texas, San Antonio, the uh, key Democrat is, uh, is Congressman Castro, right? But these members need to be hearing. There's a host of others, and we will provide it for you. But to, to tell them about, you know, again, to, to, to please... Um, support uh support unesco and again we're happy to give um if there are particular examples on, in particular issue areas we're happy to share those with you mm -hmm. thanks for your question Jax. Um, we have a couple more minutes um and so jeffrey i'll turn it to you for a question and then jerome i'll turn it to you for the last question um and then we'll we'll go from there jeffrey Hi, Jeff Laurenti with the Trenton, Prince, uh, Trenton Princeton area chapter of UNA in New Jersey. Um, and I'd like to ask both Melinda and David on this, who've ha both had experience with the executive board, which is the ongoing smaller body overseeing UNESCO's operations day to day. How hard or easy will it be for the US if it has an ambassador of, as David said, world-class stature, or at least national stature, uh, to be able to win a seat back since presumably a lot of Western countries already have put their names in for it uh, in the, um, uh, for the years coming forward. And would the president's announcing an intended appointment make any difference in Washington's uh, discussion about funding US reentry? You, uh, Jeff, it's good to see you, Jeff. And thank you for the quite very good question. Um, look, it, you can arrange to get on the executive board if if you have support from the group that the United States is in, the group one that the United States is in. They can they can put a slate together that only has enough members that you're part of it and you're going to be seated. Um, so it's a huge political global political task for the administration to undertake to, to arrange that. Um, they have an ally in uh, Audrey Azoulé and she has an incredible amount of influence. She's, I think the most powerful and influential uh, director general of UNESCO in many, many decades. And so that's something that can be used, but you know, they're, they're, the, as I've said before, and I you know hate to keep beating up on IO, but there's a long history of IO <laughs> not really one wanting to spend all their political capital either globally or domestically on UNESCO. So they need to be put under pressure too. And probably there's not much your, your membership can do to put them under pressure. That's probably a job for the National Security Council. And, and you know, the, the person who's intervened, uh, I think several times in this case, Mrs. Biden. So just to make clear, to go back to Jordy's point, we have put out to the membership a payment plan conditioned on congressional action. If we don't at least start that in 2023, I do not believe we will be able to get on the executive board. It might help to have a an ambassador of stature, but give me some names. I mean, you know, it's hard in a polarized Congress to identify someone who walks across the aisle to bring people together around this. But money will be the most important thing. I, I think that I think that the director general believes that the US will be put on the executive board. Um, you know, I don't want to say too much about that, but um, I, I think she's the resolution that he managed to get passed is incredibly uh, permissive of the United States. It's and, quite permissive. But yeah, I agree. we're able to back but, down. And we might get on initially, but if you look at the 
opposition, Russia, China, etc. cetera, we will be critiqued if we don't come up with some significant oh, I, amount of money. I agree, but in other words, you know, the, another way of putting this, which maybe isn't too nice, it, the, the Biden administration is being set up to do a lot of hard work to make sure that they get this money because they are over their skis on this UNESCO reentry at this point. And I think the director general has very artfully contributed to that situation that they're in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. I, I did want to see if we can indulge in one more question before I bring my colleague Maria Amala on. Jerome, I had promised you the last question if, if, uh, if our guest speakers don't mind staying on just a couple more minutes. Jerome? Yeah, well, I was, was, was actually responding to the questions uh, of another person several iterations, uh, iterations before about artificial general intelligence. UNESCO and the ITU are co-chairs are co of virtually everything the UN is looking at on artificial intelligence. Yeah. And right. they are totally confusing um, different kinds of artificial intelligence. There's three kinds. Narrow we have today, that's GPT, all the rest of that sort of stuff, driving your car. General, which we don't have, but that's the ability to do everything that we can do plus. And super is the thing that's beyond our control. Now, the only way we control the thing beyond our control is how general gets created. That distinction I see nowhere in anywhere in the UN system whatsoever. Now, in uh, July 14th, Bastille Day, the UN Security Council will have its first meeting on security of artificial intelligence. I am here to tell you as a friend, if they just talk about narrow, they have missed the entire game of security. General is the issue, not narrow. But people keep talking about chat, GPT, driving car, all that. Yes, that's important. But the big, big, big deal is general intelligence. And that distinction, the United States ambassador could bring up at the Security Council you as an individual could contact the State Department and say, make a distinction between narrow and general, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I am a nervous wreck about that. I've been doing futures research for 50 years. And in my judgment, the most complex, difficult problem we have to face is the management of the transition from narrow we have today to general, which we don't have today. If you don't get that right, it slides eventually into super, and then the science fiction folks will tell you what's gonna happen. Thank you, Jerome. We appreciate your comments. Say something. Um, sure. Jerome, Jerome, you're scary. You should get in front of your congressman and your, your senator and scare them. I have. I, we, I'm involved in, in a lot of different stuff. I just thought I'd bring it up here because UNESCO is, is one part of the game that has not taken this serious. Well, it's taken well, narrow seriously, but it hasn't taken general seriously. UNESCO has limitations, as does ITU. It's not a question and of limitations, it's a question of focus. They, no, no, it's a focus. You can focus as much on general as you do on narrow. It's not a question I, of limitations. I it's totally a of agree with you, but I don't well, think don't UNESCO has the right people in place to write a brief on the differences. I may be wrong, but I think so. that's what I think. Thank you so much. Um, I know we are really over time, but I definitely, we've talked a lot about her, Maria Amala. Can we bring you on? She is UNA USA's grassroots advocacy manager. Maria, we've heard the questions posed quite frequently. Um, what can UNA USA members and those who are not yet UNA USA members who are on the call do right now or tomorrow? Yeah, thank you so much, Farah. Like we just discussed, Congress provided the State Department with temporary authority to waive current funding prohibitions to UNESCO, but Congress also needs to provide the necessary money, right? So going forward for the U.S. to stay in UNESCO, we must ask Congress to support funding and oppose any prohibitions in payments in fiscal year 24. So you can do this by scanning the QR code on the screen um, or texting the word UNESCO to three zero 
six four four. Um, you'll see a link to a petition pop up, and by filling it out, you'll be asking your members of Congress to support funding for UNESCO. Now, for those UNA members on this call, your voice in this conversation is critical. There are talks in the halls of Congress that the UN is facing aggressive cuts in their US funding. Many of you all have seen the recent news. We have so much to continue fighting for, like UNESCO, full UN funding, and more. So please, please consider hosting an in-district meeting in August to discuss the importance of funds to the UN and UNESCO. The training for this will take place next Wednesday, July 19th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can find the registration for the link um, in the chat. And once again, without you, none of this would be possible. So thank you for standing up for the UN so it can keep standing up for the world. Thanks, Maria. I love the call to action. We've heard it from Ambassador Killian, from Jordy, from Melinda. Um, so if you are not yet a UNA USA member, please join us because we are indeed a movement of doers and change makers who help to, to make things like the US rejoining UNESCO happen. Um, so please take a, take a look at the QR code if you are not yet a member. And then I will quickly, quickly say a, a most heartfelt thank you to our esteemed speakers. It seems like this conversation honestly could have gone on for a couple of hours, um, but we, we will definitely continue the conversation um, as things unfold. So big thanks, Ambassador David Killian, Melinda Kimball, and Jordi Hanna. We're so grateful that you uh, shared your time and your expertise with us. Hopefully we've uh, captured some nuggets of information or um, have been a little bit educated on the processes uh, that's unfolding in front of us. So of course, while the path uh, to rejoin UNESCO hasn't been clear or easy to follow in some cases, we have heard from you as our speakers and then of course from you as our audience members that it is the right move and we are in the right direction to ensure the world's education, culture, science and press freedom. So thank you once again for joining us for this very unique town hall and we look forward to seeing you at a future UNA program. Thank you all very much.